Thanks, Mike, for that great introduction. And I need to thank Mike. He is my um, co-collaborator uh, for Sitka Whale Fest, which we have every November in Sitka, usually the first weekend. This year, it's the second weekend in November. And Mike helps me uh, select the speakers. Um, for years, oh, for a couple of years, when we first started Whale Fest, 15 years ago, it's just hard to imagine that Walt Cunningham, a pinniped uh, uh, technician for Fish and Game, helped me pick the, the the people to come to talk on pinnipeds or the seals and sea lions and I selected the, the whales and, and Walt unfortunately died in a tragic diving accident and that year Mike came and then he's carried the torch ever since and so I'm very very grateful for Mike and not only for his, uh, his expertise for the researchers that do um, pinniped research but also for just bringing the two campuses together between UAF and UAS it's really a nice cross pollination of having um, the interaction and, and having it in Sitka every November. So if you're interested, it's uh, sitkawhalefest.org on the website. So, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about my 30 years of um, studying humpback whales. So it's going to be um, how I started, kind of the middle years, and then what I'm doing now and, and today with more collaborators and, and more tools. So I did have lots of support, lots of collaborators, and this is my husband, John. Um, you might know him from his books. He's written six uh, mystery novels, crime novels, um, set in Alaska. And he's wrecked my skiff two or three times in these books. <laughs> and what I have given him is a lot of details, a lot of adventures for his novels. And so many of the uh, adventures that he, he has, a uh, you might think are fiction, are actually truth, and then some that might be truthful, he has stretched it into fiction. So this is a, my contribution to him. He first started with me um, going to Admiralty Island, which is the island just south of Juneau and north of Petersburg, to a place called Seymour Canal. And that's where I first started this research. And the other people that helped this was um, K.J. Metcalf was the Admiralty Island National Monument. In 19, those late 70s and early 80s, um, Admiralty Island had just become a national monument. And K.J. Metcalf was the uh, first monument manager and he was very forward thinking and he let us look at humpback whales, why we should have been doing something else for the Forest Service, if not the, because for, the Forest Service has no jurisdiction over humpback whales. But they happened to be in the canal and there we were. So um, Kathy Hazard was a student, or she worked with Charles Jaraz and he was a high school biology teacher out of Juneau that pioneered some of this early research. Jim and Carol Greeno are people that helped us forge our way and those early days and Dr. Bud Fay was my advisor here at UAF and he he had never seen a humpback and he supported me and he when I applied to graduate school he was the only person that would accept me with my own data set and so I'm very very grateful to Bud and Jen Cedarleaf is my right hand assistant in Sitka she manages all the data and knows all the whales because I, I don't anymore actually she manages the entire collaborative database between Glacier Bay National Park and that's where Chris Gabriel and Janet Nielsen work and, and we have um, developed this comprehensive way of looking at whales in southeastern Alaska and the Park Service biologists and my um, staff and biologists we all use the same techniques and the same database and Scott Baker, Terry Quinn and John Moran are other partners that I've worked with and um, a lot of students and Sheldon Jackson High School which is no longer our college which is no longer in business but I had students from um, Sheldon Jackson, Bates College, Humboldt high school, both high schools in Sitka, just a numerous people. I can't, I just want to spend time on this because they have helped so much develop this program over 30 years. So 30 years, I'm going to talk about the beginning, how humpbacks entered my life, and some basic facts about humpbacks. I know you're, we're here in Fairbanks, and when I came to school here in biological oceanography, it's going, going whoa, there's no ocean. Well, as everybody told me, Every ocean in Alaska is equidistant from Fairbanks, which is true. And so, um, and even now we have humpbacks up in the Arctic, and so you can find humpbacks equidistantly from anywhere in Fairbanks. So I'm going to talk about the middle years, the data, collect, the data collection, how um, I work with my collaborators, and then the current research. Again, working with a lot of collaborators, some very new, up-to-date, cutting-edge tools, and what is the future for humpbacks in Alaskan waters. So here are the geese. These are the animals or the birds that led me to studying humpbacks. And you think it's a little unusual. Why? What is this connection? This makes no sense. 
Well, in uh, the late 70s, I was working for the Forest Service, and they sent me out to do a study, work with a, a team of people in this area called Seymour Canal, and we were looking at geese and what their brooding habits during the summer. And they're non-migratory, meaning they don't go anywhere during the uh, uh, winter months. But nobody knew where they spent the winters. And so we had radio collared some, and I talked KJ Metcalf, that great forward thinker, into letting John and Jan go to the cabin for the whole winter. And John was game for this. He was a real trooper. So um, we loaded all of our stuff at the float plane dock, took a float plane out to Seymour Canal. They dropped us off. There's our skiff in the corner with all of our stuff in this little ratty cabin. And we turned around, and the place literally looked like a sprinkler system had broken. It was just humpback whale blows everywhere. There must have been 80 to 100 humpback whales within a three-mile radius of the cabin. And we go, wow, that's really cool. We didn't, have, you know, by then, that was really the early, early stages of people doing humpback whale research. And I knew there were people doing it in Hawaii, but I said, wow, I've got a gold mine. All these whales aren't migrating. I'm going to be famous. And so, so there, this is what it looks like in Seymour. There's groups of four, five, six, ten whales just zooming around Seymour Canal. And um, just, here's more whales. Just This is right in front of our cabin site. It was a terrible anchorage. We flipped the skiff. These taku winds would come down and we'd wake up in the morning and the skiff would be turned over. And it was the, we used two stroke outboards then and they were totally, it was so cold, everything was frozen. But the cool thing is that with a two stroke, you can take the cowling off, pull out the, the um, spark plugs and a core of ice comes out with it, and then you rinse it out and you can start them up again. <laughs> we did that a lot. So. so, and there John is diligently listening for those geese. He's, <laughs> we, we did it, we were religious about doing it, besides looking at humpbacks by then, but um, we really tried hard. And there John is, um, if you've ever been in Sitka, there's a, we didn't have a um, Raven radio, we didn't have an FM radio station, then we had, we had an AM radio station, KFW. And, Everybody listened to Problem Corner, and what John was really doing here was perfecting his Problem Corner voice. So he bought and sold a lot of equipment listening for those geese. There are, there's a cabin that we stayed in, and there's me, a much, much younger um, whale biologist, fledgling whale biologist, and it was really a nice time for us. We ended up spending a number of winters here and then going back off and on over the last uh, 30 years. And you will never catch me in weather like this now. This was, this was, we were young, we were, we were, I was, we're going out no matter what the weather is. Of course, a camera would get wet and photos would be terrible, but I was still out there doing the research. So, um, so on to humpback whales. Who are they? They are a baleen whale. They have a worldwide distribution and they have the longest known mammalian migration, 98 kilometers from Brazil to Madagascar. And that was just recent in the last year. They feed in high latitudes in both hemispheres and give birth in the tropicals or near tropical waters. Uh, gestation is about 11 months. They become pregnant on the breeding grounds and then give birth either en route or on the breeding grounds about a year later. And they give birth every two to three years. Some females can give birth annually, but um, on average it's two to three years. They're about 15 feet at birth. They weigh about 1,500 pounds. And females, as in all baleen whales, are larger than the males the longest uh, whale it, known in the southern hemisphere whales are bigger than the northern hemisphere for some reason and 56 feet was the largest female and they weighed about 90,000 uh, pounds and um, their lifespan we thought was about 50 years and now I'm going to talk about this and um, why we think now it's a hundred or years or more and their vocalizations are very very complex they're the whales that you hear about when you go to Maui that are singing, the males are singing the songs, and they still really don't know why humpback whales sing. And I don't study that part of uh, the humpback whale biological aspect, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about it, but, I, but I'm willing to ask questions, and I can speculate like the best person, or the best researcher. Humpback whales have a very long flipper. These are the, um, they're a third of their body length, and so if you're out in the ocean and you're not quite sure what whale you see, really try to get a look at their flippers because if it's a long, long flipper, usually with white on one surface, it's a humpback. And they also have these nodules on um, upper and lower rostrum. Right here, this is a whale that's lunging out of um, the water. Usually, it probably just grabs some fish. Use this. And right here, you can see these bumps or nodules, and each one of those bumps has a hair. So, bingo, mammal has a hair. And they have this nice hump 
Um, there it's hence the name humpbacks, and they arch their hump when they dive. And we actually can match whales by individually by their dorsal fin. In fact, Glacier Bay National Park, where Chris and Janet work, they have almost every single one of their whales matched, not only by their flukes, but by the left and right dorsal fins. Um, but they have a much smaller catalog than my catalog of over 2,000 humpbacks. So what's a marine mammal? And here I'm talking about marine mammals and there's some physiologists in the room, so. Um, but I think I can handle this part of it. They're descendants of land mammals adapted to live in an aquatic environment. They breathe air, they're warm-blooded, they nurse their young. They are just a regular, normal mammal. They just happen to live in the ocean. And they have adaptions, adaptations that include, they have an increased insulation. They're either in terms of blubber like the cetaceans or dense fur like a sea otter. And they've made circulatory adjustments to minimize heat loss. They can shut down their extremities to save on heat loss when they're in cold water. And they have modified limbs, noses, and ears, and eyes to live in the water. And they have an increased sensory ability. And some have an acute sense of smell. They've just figured out that bowheads actually can smell, or they're, they're pretty certain that they can smell. And they're capable of, well, of very long, deep dives. Humpbacks don't de dive as deep as a sperm whale, but they can still dive pretty deep. And humpback whales have a paired blowhole. Basically, they have a split nostril, just like we do, and they close it when they dive. And this is, this is the same whale. You can see that piece of kelp is, is the same in each photo. And so this is a whale when it's just at the surface breathing. And then right there, it's got its blowhole shut. And again, those are those nodules with, remember, one single hair through each of those, on each of those nodules. And there the blowhole is up close and center. And they have diving adaptations. Their ribs are flexible. They can collapse when they dive. And this is a whale diving. And this is what this whale is doing. This is right in front of Sitka Sound. This is an echo sounder. This is some of the tools that we use to tell what they're feeding on. And right here, this is a whale track. It was right underneath my boat. I had a little echo sounder. And it's going down. You can see this track line in this red. It got really dense. It's this red, this thick red, is the bottom of the ocean. And this whale just went down and swam virtually right along the bottom. And this is a big krill layer. So this whale was diving to four, 400 feet. The, long, the deepest dive I've been able to track in Sitka Sound has been um, just about um, uh, uh, 600 or 600 feet. So they also have a very thick tissue in the middle ear, which with, can withstand pressure at depth. And they can slow their heart rate, they can reduce their oxygen consumption, and again, send blood to the only essential parts of their body. So they're really, really good at diving in these deep conditions in cold water. So they also have numerous plates of baleen. They don't have teeth, they have baleen on each side of their upper, upper jaw. Right here, there's about 300 plate, plates of baleen. It's like a fine fringe comb right here on each side. This, this, is, this is six plates of baleen that came out of a, of a boat. And uh, this boat was sunk in Whale Bay, just south of Sitka. It's a 100-foot or 100-year-old um, old wooden sailboat. People went to this quiet little bay, anchored up. They went kayaking. They came back, and all they saw was their mast of their boat. And they said, whoa, our boat sank. What happened? Nothing was around. It was calm, sandy bottom. And they brought the, uh, the boat up, and they found a big, right at the base of the keel, a big three-foot hole. And, and the guy said, I think a whale hit my boat. And everybody's going, yeah, right. Well, he found this baleen, this fresh baleen, in the middle of his boat. And it was, I, then I had it genetically tested, and it was a humpback baleen. So the guy was right. This, and nobody knows what happened to the whale. And nobody knows really how, what happened. How did this whale, they can make mistakes. I mean, it was probably, who knows what happened. It's speculation. And they do not echolocate. They do not send out a sound signal and receive a sound signal back like a toothed whale, a sperm whale, or a killer whale. However, it is thought that they may do, use passive acoustics to find their way around the ocean. It's as if there was a dark room and you were, it was empty and you were trying to find out where the door was. You might tap on the side of the wall or you might say something you could hear that it was re echoing cavernous. Or if it was full of furniture, your voice wouldn't sound it might sound more muffled. So they may send out some sound signals to um, ha use more what we might call passive acoustics to find their way around the ocean. So they can also stretch their lower jaw greater than 90 degrees. So it's not exactly 
uh, disarticulation, but they're basically, they're, they have these stays at the um, frontal mandibular stays and they can basically pull their, their lower jaw and reshape it to create a larger engulfment of water. And here the whale is on its side, it's doing its lateral lunge feeding, this is a lower jaw. This is the upper jaw, you can see those fringe like a baleen right there. And a whale can consume about four tenths of a ton of food per day. This is data from Bree Wittavine's master's thesis. She looked at some historical whaling data and then did some work out of Kodiak. And there's, you'll, might, you'll find this number all over the web. Well, you'll find on average about a ton a day, but really in Bree's data, it was not a ton a day. It's about a little less than a ton a day per, per whale. And they can engulf 15,000 gallons of seawater and prey. And this is a lot of volume of seawater and prey. And it's, it's more than most people can imagine because they have these ventral grooves that expand, that create an, an extension like a big water balloon. And then again, they can re reshape that lower jaw. And um, there's some people that were uh, kind of doubting that this was really happening. So, and this is John Moran at Ockbay Lab, who I work with a lot, he's going, that can't be true. And he did, the, he did the math. He said, well, the math comes out right, but I still don't believe it. And so this is, this is what a graduate student is good for, Susie Tierlink, our graduate student that's working on humpback whale data in Prince William Sound. She got to stand next to this big 10,000-gallon um, fuel tank at the Lena Point facility, Noah's Lena Point facility in, in uh, Juneau. And, um, and we compared that with this big bloated humpback that was uh, found, that washed ashore in southeastern Alaska on Cube Cove. And John measured both um, uh, volumes and they came out about the same. So he uh, finally, I think, believed that this is true, that a whale truly can engulf 15,000 gallons of seawater. They don't consume it, they don't swallow it, they sieve it out through their baleen. And so what do they eat? Well, their esophagus and their throat it really isn't very big. It's only about the big size of a big grapefruit. And so the the largest uh, prey that I've been able to find in the whaling literature has been pink salmon. And I never knew if that was pink salmon adults or pink salmon juveniles or smolts or fry. Um, but we had a whale um, in Sitka feeding on, uh, that was documented feeding on adult pink salmon. So, and, they, and they don't get, sometimes they're only a, a two or three pounds. So I'm pretty certain that whale, the whale, the data in the whaling literature probably was uh, pink, adult pink salmon. But really, they feed on herring, schooling fish, forage fish, capelin, um, sand lance, all those uh, important forage fish that we have that are like the linchpin of our ecosystems. And they are generalists. They really capitalize on whatever's out there. And they also feed on krill, zooplankton, which is a small um, shrimp-like, um, um, it's, it's just like a very, very small shrimp. And it's, it, it's in uh, swarms in the ocean at, in southeastern Alaska. And especially in Frederick Sound, you often see surface swarms where you can just go and scoop it up at the surface. And this is a whale that was feeding on a layer of herring out right in Sitka Sound. It's 100, the bottom, this again is sounder, and this is again one of the tools that I use to tell what the whales are doing in the ocean. It's 124 meters depth, it's 11.8 degrees centigrade, and uh, so it's pretty cool. And this whale, this is a prey layer right here. This is the bottom, that red, and this is a pretty thin player a prey layer and this is a whale that so I had my boat right here and the whale would dive on the one side of my boat it come down and you can see it was just doing these feeding bouts up and down so it was probably just lunging right through this prey layer then it'd come up on the other side of my boat and then he'd dive on this side and he'd come up on the other side he did this for hours so this is how you can just see how they're feeding at depth and what they're how many uh, feeding bouts that they would do during one dive cycle So we also know that what they're eating by looking at direct observations of whales feeding and, and specifically whales feeding on herring. This is some work that I did in Prince William Sound with the Aquae Lab NOAA um, biologists where um, humpback whale or herring have a not recovered in Prince William Sound. That, let's put it this way, they are. They just are not doing as well as some people like the commercial fishermen would like to have herring uh, be. And um, so we were funded by the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustees Council to see if humpback whales perhaps are having an, an impact on suppressing the uh, recovery of uh, herring. And so we went out there from September to May for two years, to um, September to March actually, and we found quite a few, uh, quite a lot of herring actually, um, more than I expected. And also they're in these great dome shapes 
and the, there were layers, but there were all sorts of configurations, depending if they're earlier or later. So this is a big dome of herring. This is a whale diving right into it. So we're pretty convinced. We were pretty convinced that was herring. Well, and then all of a sudden, all these herring, like this herring, started popping up around us. And it was just like they were alive, half stunned. And it was like, wow, this is like Christmas. Because all, we were just able to go and scoop up all the herring until the bird birds got them. For some reason, and this has never happened in southeastern Alaska, that these whales were stunning the fish at depth and then they were missing some and they were coming up to the surface. So it was really a nice opportunity for us to verify what we were seeing on the sounder and what we were seeing on the surface in terms of what the whales were actually eating. So they also use high frequency sounds for foraging. Uh, you've heard of bubble net lunge feeding that whales do in southeastern Alaska where they blow a curtain of bubbles and then they make a, this feeding call and then they come up, to the, come up right through the middle of it. And when the first bubble meets the last bubble is when they lunge. And um, I'm going to play the feeding call right here. Might be kind of loud. about this. So that's the ring of bubbles right there. This is a, 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 a painting actually or a drawing. And this is it's one whale that makes these bubbles and this is Fred Sharp's PhD dissertation. He, he, sh he showed some of this documented that it's one whale that blows the, the ring of bubbles and when there's a large group of humpbacks like this that, that uh, diameter of that circle can be almost a hundred feet in diameter and the bubbles are about cantaloupe size and so they time it quite well when one when that feeding call ends, the first bubble has met the last bubble and then they come lunging like this. And this was a group of almost 30 humpbacks that were lunging together in the southern end of, uh, of the archipelago, just north of the Canadian uh, border um, and, and you know, Forrester Island. And so it's pretty spectacular to see this. And they've only been shown, they only, as far as I know, do the lunch feeding, the feeding call, which is, is thought that it's to use to stun or to, to manipulate the herring. It's, Fred was, it's not totally proven positive, but it's pretty sh certain that it's most likely used to um, maneuver those herring upwards into the surface, right to the surface, and the whales come underneath and lunge with their mouths open right through it, like these two whales here. And you can see this, the, how dense the herring are right here. They're just boiling at the surface right here and there's a whale that again this is the upper jaw and the lower jaw upper jaw and the lower jaw so and this is actually seen bubble net lunch feeding when the people come up to southeastern Alaska because they've seen it so much on TV they're often really really disappointed that that all they see is what really from a cruise ship or a tour boat is what really looks like a floating chocolate chip on the ocean you see it floating around and then it disappears and it comes up eight or nine ten minutes later and it floats around again and then shows its flukes and dives. So um, someday I would really like to do the documentary that shows what it's really like to be a whale biologist and what it's really like to study humpback whales because it's a lot of slow time in the boat. Just looking at your watch, they're there. Because typically the dive pattern is they show their flukes, they dive at depth, and then they come up and you really don't know what they're doing. It's a, it's a lucky chance that you really get to see this type of behavior. This is another feeding behavior that humpbacks do and it's called echelon feeding. It's like drafting when you're a bicycle racing. One whale basically drafts the other whale and they're feeding usually, uh, sometimes it's on small forage fish, but usually this is almost exclusively on, on krill or zooplankton that's at the surface. So in terms of understanding exactly what they're feeding on, if you see the feeding behavior and if you can look at the prey depth on a sounder and get some idea of connecting those two, you can without even sampling or having a net to sample, you can often make a good judgment call as to what they're feeding. And also if you know what, if you know enough about oceanography and what the, the potential prey could be in the area and what that prey should be in terms of seasonal distribution too. Because herring in the winter lay down in a nice layer and the whales are feeding on them just as if they would be feeding on a layer of krill during the summer. But in the summertime, those herring are, ball, are schooled up in balls and the whales have to chase them all over the place. So if you see a whale in the summertime going up and down in one spot 
and you know it's a predominantly an area where krill have been sampled there in the past or you know it's, it's typically a krill area, you can pretty much say they're probably feeding on krill like in the middle of Frederick Sound. But if, there's, if they're following something along the shoreline and their behavior is very, very erratic, you can probably say it's some type of fish. And this is the uh, boat I use. It's a 23-foot ponga. Um, we actually have a larger boat now that um, my husband John and our son will go out. We'll go out for sometimes a couple weeks, and we'll be on the big boat and we'll tow the the skiff. I have taken the skiff around for, uh, around Admiralty Island a number of times, and um, the last trip I got really really soaking wet and ruined a camera. So I just said, "That's it. We're getting a bigger boat." So, like I I would never be caught in the snowstorm like I was in Seymour Canal either. And um, the technique that we started using was using photo ID just having a simple digital or simple um, film camera and we started actually with slides and taking photographs of the underside of the tails and my early photographs were really really terrible um, and this is actually a whale coming towards us and the white underneath is is the side we're really looking for is the um, is the uh, ventral surface of the flukes the dorsal surface will work but it's really that black and white pattern that we're looking for like this. So this is a part of our catalog and this is the poster is on the is in the catalog as well. And if you get a photograph of a humpback whale and for southeastern in southeastern Alaska, we have almost uh, over 2000 whales in this catalog from 100% white is categorized from in sections from white to dark and uh, you can go in and try to match your, your whale. And I should say that um, People have developed matching programs. There's a number of very good ones out there on the market. Um, however, for our whales, because we have almost 70% uh, whales that have no white on them at all, it really doesn't work to use a pattern recognition. People say, you know, this Mac, my Mac has a program that'll recognize face as well. It doesn't recognize a face with every face is just the same flat black. And you really have to use, look at the trailing edge to really match individual whales. And it's quite an art. Some people are very, very good at it, and some people it takes them a long time to really catch on to um, really matching. It's like playing the game on concentration. It's just it's a, an acquired skill. And reproduction, the females give birth on, or get, become mature at four to five years. So they're sexually mature at four to five years. And as I said, um, they give birth on average every two to three years. So, but they don't have a, when they don't show up in southeastern Alaska, until they're eight years old with their first calf. So age at first birth is not until eight years old. And we know this because we were able to photograph with this long-term sighting histories, taking photographs, whales we saw as calves, and then we were able to see them later on as juveniles, and then later on as adults, an adult with a calf. So we have a number of whales in our known age catalog where we actually positively know how old they are. And we know that one in five calves does not make it from Hawaii where they breed to Alaska. We did this by going, collaborating with our researchers in Hawaii, and they showed it. They gave us all the photographs. They had a females that had calves in a certain year, and then we looked in our catalogs for that same whale in the feeding area in southeastern Alaska, and we found that one in five calves didn't make it, which is actually a pretty high mortality rate. How old do they get? Well, this is a whale. Uh, this is a whale called Big Mama. She was one of the leaders of the of a, the Chatham Strait lunch feeding group for years and years and years. Chuck Duras first photographed her in the late '60s. She looked exactly the same when she was last seen. At the, I think about the age, at least a minimum age of 35. In um, I think I saw her last in the '90s sometime. And um, so we can figure out how old they are by photographing them from the time they're calves and to the time they are um, adults. Or, if you can find a fresh dead whale, you can get the earplug. And humpbacks have a very nice um, earplug that can be sliced, and the growth layer groups can be counted, just like a tree can uh, tree rings can be counted to age these whales. Well, um, the whaling biologists knew how to do this, and they were very, very good at this, and they used. Um, two growth layer groups per year as their basis of unit of measurement to say how old the whale was. And so the oldest whale in the whaling literature for humpbacks was, uh, I think, 48 years old in the southern hemisphere. Well, in um, the year 2001, this whale, whale 68, was uh, struck by a cruise ship at the mouth of Glacier Bay. And the whale was very, very fresh when it was uh, 
stranded and they were able to get the earplug. You have to get really quickly to the earplug, otherwise it dis disintegrates because it's made out of a waxy material. And so Chris Gabriel, who um, got the earplug with Francis Gulland, a, a, a marine mammal a veterinarian out of California, uh, she actually got it. She was just great at getting things like this out of dead whales. Um, we knew it, it was first seen by Chuck Duraz and Ginny Palmer in Glacier Bay in 1975 and last seen in 2001. So we knew at a minimum she was uh, 27 years old if it was at a minimum if she was a calf when that when it was first sighted in 75. Chuck and Ginny say they probably she wasn't a calf but we don't know that for, for certain. So we had, um, Chris had uh, two, she found amazingly there are still people out there that that know how to age these whales and Christina Lockyer out of Norway and, and Kato-san out of uh, Japan did independent counts and you can see how difficult it is here counting these ear, ear ring, or growth layer groups. Uh, over here when the wh whale was younger they're quite spaced apart and as the whale gets older they get tighter and tighter because it's a, it's a um, finite space in there. It's, it's an enclosed space and so as they get older it gets really really harder and harder to age each whale. And same thing here with these red dots. I drew a line here but you can see they're spaced out. The red's a little bit harder to see. But they did this over and over and Chris carted this, this earplug going around all the marine mammal conferences with a dissecting scope for years and got them to do repeat counts. And um, they came out to be fairly si similar to four, 44, and 40, um, 44 and 45 growth layer groups. So. So if the whale it was at a minimum, it was, had been seen for 27 years, if we were going by the, the um, two growth layer groups a year, or two, um, it, uh, yeah, let me get this, the math right. If they were going to be, um, I think it was, yeah, two growth layer groups for, anyway, it was, it's, I'm losing my uh, math here. If it was going by the whaling data, it was going to be 56 years old but at a minimum. But they didn't get anything older than 45 or 44 growth layer groups, which, which mean if it was one layer growth layer group per year, it would be um, just 44 or 45. And even with the statistical variance, it um, couldn't have been as old as the whaling data um, techniques were. So and this is just a one sample size, sample size of, of one, that where we really feel that that humpback whales probably are older than what the whaling data literature is saying, probably twice as old. And this was published in Marine Mammal Science and you can go and look up this uh, article and then and I can read it and remember what the math is. So um, it's, it's, it's one of the, uh, and I make a big deal about it in this talk because, um, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, in that humpback whales are increasing in numbers, in, especially in southeastern Alaska, and we're going to see more and more ship strikes as, and more interactions with human activities. And we're going to have the opportunity, unfortunately, to be able to um, capture some of these whales and really build a database in terms of, of using everything that we can when a whale is found dead, and especially if it's found dead and it's very, very fresh. And I can bring down people like Todd O'Hara, and some of the other marine mammal uh, veterinarians to really do a good job at a necropsy, which would be um, something I think we really need to strive for, and, and it's like my mantra these days. You know, we can't we can't lose that opportunity. Um, and one, because during the whaling, when they the biologists were at the whaling stations or on the whaling ships, they really maximized everything that they. Um, they got out of those whales. And this is how we have the basis for so much of the information we know today. And even the whales that are, are harvested on the north, in the northern part of uh, Alaska, the bowheads, they really maximize, they get everything. They know so much about those animals because they really have the, have the foresight to really go out and get the data and just not waste the animal. Um, and it's um, just a really important consideration that um, I'm promoting everywhere I go. So in 2004 and 2006, so back to these long-term sighting history data is what we've had to, because we aren't going out and, and harvesting humpbacks anymore. Um, they were um, protected in 1966 in U.S. waters and were actually harvested into the uh, 70s and into the early 80s. Um, and even r more recent than that in some of the other oceans. But, so we don't have the opportunity to have um, dead animals very often. 
So these long-term sighting histories by taking these photographs tells us where whales move and where they're moving to and what their stock structure is. And you can just get a lot of information out of just looking at a photograph, but it just takes us a long time. And in 2004 to 2006, there was um, a basin-wide study throughout the North Pacific was, was amazingly funded, not very much by NOAA, but some private money and some by NOAA. And it was, um, or National Fisheries Service, which is the management agency responsible for um, managing uh, humpback whales. And we, there's a lot of things we didn't know. And um, like we didn't know where the offshore wha Mexico whales went for in the, to feed. And we really didn't know what was happening on the Russian side. And we didn't know much about what was happening in Asia. Um, we knew there was a really strong link between um, Alaska and Hawaii. Well, southeastern Alaska, this big dot here in Hawaii. But other than that, we didn't know to the extent of all this. And all these lines here are all whales that matched. So a whale photograph down here, or this blue line down here in Panama, in the green coastal Mexico, go to the west coast of the US for feeding. Uh, Hawaii, they s spread out all over the Gulf of Alaska here, and even over here into a little bit into the um, western side of the Pacific. Asia, the Philippines, and uh, Okinawa go up to the Russian side. Ogasawara is a different story. It goes, spreads out over here and mixes over here to the Aleutians. In fact, uh, whales from Ogasawara have been found in Japan, I mean in uh, Kodiak, and also off Vancouver Island. It's not in here. It, wasn't, it was found before Splash. But it, there's also linkages to Vancouver Island right here in northern, uh, the coast of uh, Washington. So they migrate seasonally. So they go from these breeding areas and they migrate up to these discrete feeding aggregations. And these discrete feeding aggregations are, are directed by the female. So if you do genetics and look at the mitochondrial DNA, which is associated with, with your mother or the females, you will find a direct um, feeding aggregation where all the whales in southeastern Alaska have the same mitochondrial same, actually two mitochondrial DNA haplotypes, even though they all mix from multiple feeding areas on the Hawaiian uh, wintering grounds. So in terms of their stock structure, it's more complicated than what you might even, um, even imagine. So southeastern Alaska, if, you, if your mom brings you to southeastern Alaska as a calf, you then, when you grow up as an adult, you will come to southeastern Alaska. And if you're a female, you'll bring your calves there. So we call that this maternally directed fidelity to the feeding area. And this SPLASH study, and SPLASH stands, stands for the Structure of Populations, Levels of Abundance, and Status of Humpbacks. It took us a long time to come up with that acronym. So it was the hardest part about the whole study. No, actually, finding funding was, but um, actually, I think the hardest part was everybody in a room trying to decide to do the same thing. But <laughs> um, we now know that there are 18 to 20,000 humpbacks in the North Pacific, and they're increasing at 5 to 7% a year. They're not increasing evenly across the Pacific. Asia was uh, whaling stopped there more recently than over on the eastern Gulf or eastern side of the Pacific. So the Asian population is slower to recover. There aren't, they aren't doing nearly as well as the whales, say, in southeastern Alaska that are really cranking, I have to say. So here is a, the area that we're talking about here, feet, uh, Gulf of Alaska, where I where I work, and, um, and Prince William Sound. So the work that I've been doing in Prince William Sound with the Oak Bay Lab folks, the SPLASH study just lumped um, the northern gulf from Kodiak all the way over to Prince William Sound as, as one feeding aggregation. Well, the work that we've been doing in Prince William Sound has, has shown actually something differently. And so even though there was this big study called SPLASH, there's still more to know and more um, studies to, to actually look at some of the finer scale stock structure. So uh, this is actually a repeat here. Um, what I didn't say was in the early 1900s, there were just in the northern, um, not the Asian side, there were, we estimated there were about 6,000 humpbacks just from um, western um, U.S., from Hawaii, um, Mexico, and the, basically our study area from Kodiak West, and you could, Kodiak East. So you can see that the population has done really, really well on our side of the uh, Pacific. So, and in southeastern Alaska and British Columbia, there are, it's the biggest feeding aggregation at about 3,000 to 5,000 humpback whales. And we know because of the genetics and um, because of movement 
there, the whales that we have in British Columbia are the same population, the same feeding aggregation as the whales in southeastern Alaska all the way up to, up to Yakutat. And we know that they can get to Hawaii in 30 days. Chris Gabriel was a, a graduate student for the University of Hawaii in the 80s and I was photographing whales in Sitka in January of, in, of the same year that she photographed a whale that when I sent her the photograph she matched that the whale that it took that whale at, at, a, um, at the um, most um, 36 days to get to Hawaii sick from Sitka to Hawaii in January and Bruce mate has he's the guy that just tagged the gray whale that's going all that's going all over the place um, he tagged a whale from Hawaii that got to the BC coast in a month so so it pretty much matched what we had been finding so whales can still be present in Sitka Sound or in the waters of Alaska into January and even into um, early February and still make it in a month to the peak of the mating and calving season in Hawaiian waters. So um, in Juneau and other places where I give this lecture where people see whales present in the winter, they think that they had a huge group of uh, overwintering whales that aren't migratory. Well, in reality, they really do migrate. Um, the, but what I found over my years and those whales that I first found in, in Seymour Canal when I thought I found a gold mine and was going to be famous, really they were whales that were just late migrants. They finally eventually did migrate and um, for the most part it's just staggered. We have whales that leave early that come back early and whales that leave later and come back later. And there's just some overlap in the winter. There are a few whales that do truly overwinter. However, um, not very many. I think it's been maybe 15 whales over the entire span of my study. And that includes whales in Princeum Sound and uh, um, southeastern Alaska. So for the most part, there are not that many whales. And why do they miss that migration? I don't know. We talked about it once at Whale Fest. And wh what, what did we come up with, Mike? I can't even remember. You know, I think we, we figured they probably had to migrate in terms of genetic mixing. But why some whales just forego migration? We don't know. I just think they kind of lose track of time. The food's really good, and by the time February rolls around, they say, oh, well, I just better stay here. And for some reason, and it's not just the non-reproducing females. It's males, it's females, it's juveniles. And even last year, we had a mom and calf over winter in, um, in Prince William Sound. So some of the techniques that we use to study whales these days, you know, I've gone from using just a simple camera to using a sounder to understand what's happening. Um, in the, in the water column and a few, uh, actually in the 80s we started um, using, a bio getting biopsy samples, meaning you have to go up and basically shoot the whale with a small dart. It's right there, you can see the dart has a little orange tip on it. Some people use a retrievable dart, right there, and it pops out, it floats and you go by and scoop it up. And there's the sample. So here's the skin, it looks like a piece of visqueen of a humpback and the blubber sample is the white and here's the dart tip and these are this this style of um, tip was designed by um there's a lot of different styles out there but this was a designed by the killer whale guys in BC and it has a, a little brush inside that that you force out with this um, tool right there and it um is an ex it extracts and just pushes out so that this uh, root canal is real sticky and so that's what holds the, the tissue in there and then you just push it out with that extractor and it makes a really nice sample. Um, other ways you can use is a, is a three-pronged approach inside that holds a, the tissue in the or that holds a sample in, in a dart tip and it's shot with a crossbow. However, we did a lipid analysis with Ocbe Lab with their nutritional um, um, lab and we looked at the lipid content of the same whale shot at the exact, exactly the same time between the crossbow tip and the rifle tip and we you lose a lot of lipids with the, uh, with the crossbow tip. So we're just pretty much sticking to the uh, biopsy with the, this, that's a pneumatic rifle that veterinarians use and we're even using it for sperm whales and it's usually working quite well for sperm whales where I've lost a lot of uh, equipment on sperm whales because they're like hitting um, armor. So what's the difference between using just straight photo ID and using molecular genetic techniques that you can get from a biopsy sample. And this is just a, a, a subsample of kind of, of what the parameters you can get from um, looking at long-term sighting history. You can get population structure. You can know where whales move to, what their migratory destinations are. And you can get a lot of life history parameters, birth interval, survival rate, age at first birth, and even abundance estimates using a mark recapture 
type of um, procedure. So, and that's all really great, and it's get, taken us a long way. But when you l build in the molecular genetic um, techniques, you can again get population structure, but you can also learn the geographic variation. You can get paternity, you can get individual relatedness, and mating systems, and pregnancy, sexing, and toxicology, contaminants, you name it. Um, you can just, you, know, you can get diet information, you can get trophic levels, you can get um, understand whether a whale is feeding on fish or zooplankton. It's just a whole suite. So it's a very, very powerful tool. So some of the data that was collected in Splash, um, Bree Wittavine and I and some of our co-authors in the Gulf of Alaska, because we work, Bree works in Kodiak and Olga von Zygazar and Craig Mack can work inside Prince William Sound and we work in those little boats and, I work in, and uh, Chris and I work in Southeast. And we don't ever get offshore in our little boats, but we know there are humpbacks out there. And it's, I've been dying to know, are those offshore humpbacks the same whales that we get inside southeastern Alaska? Basically, are our coastal neighbors, are the offshore whales different than our coastal neighbors? So we use genetics, movement, and stable isotopes to, to um, ass assess this. And this is just about ready to be published in, um, uh, I think, a uh, uh, Endangered Species uh, Review. Um, so we took Kodiak, Prince William Sound, and Southeast, and the Kodiak is a little bit of a misnomer here because it really encompasses Cook Inlet and the Barren Islands here. So, and all the blue dots are the whales we considered as offshore, and these were collected by, fortunately, NOAA that has big ships, so they were do, be able to do, during Splash, two years of big ship surveys, and the green dots, and of course there are more of them because you know, we're in these little boats and we can cover a lot of territory, um, are, are inshore whales. And, and our uh, reviewer criticized, one of the reviewers criticized us in terms of how we define inshore and offshore. And we finally just had to come down to it. We looked at a lot of literature and everybody was, the dolphin people especially are all over the map. It's really arbitrary how they define it. And um, so we just basically said, what are we really, we're really looking at how far we can get in our little boats. So that's how we defined it. And it's, it's past peer review, it's, 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 which really is true. I mean, we really can't get very far out beyond the, the edge of the uh, coast where you get into the big ocean swell. So, um, and what did we find? So, we found there was a lot of haplotype diversity. So haplotypes, remember, are those um, maternally, uh, um, the, uh, um, the maternal uh, the haplotype inherited from your mother. So, um, and your Moms brings you to southeastern Alaska, remember, and then you, you have that same pretty much genetic haplotype. Well, here's offshore whales, the pie chart. This is a, this is a two haplotypes for the offshore, southeastern Alaska, and it's really even, even more uniform than that. It's like A plus and A minus, so it's even more boring than that. So genetically, they're really similar. So we pretty much genetically, the whales were the same whales offshore as inshore. And if you go down to BC, you get the same thing. It looks just the same pie chart. So. So when you look at the pie charts here for Prince William Sound offshore and inshore, and this is statistically not significant either. So, but this offshore area, Prince William Sound, is, is a little bit of, um, we need a few more samples out there, but it pretty much did tell us that uh, there was something going on there between Kodiak inshore and Kodiak, uh, Prince William Sound offshore. And definitely the Kodiak inshore and offshore whales are also the same. So all those three groups may end up being the same feeding aggregation. Well, the real difference is this little loner up here inside Prince William Sound. And almost all the genetic samples were taken from inshore Prince William Sound. And that is really, really a different um, pie chart than anywhere else. And so we pretty much concluded that the whales that are, are actually inside Prince William Sound are most likely a separate um, distinct um, genetic population. So, and uh, we did do trophic level work as, as well, and um, I'm not gonna go into that too much, it's just that Prince William Sound also was really distinct trophically. It, it was feeding at a much higher uh, trophic level, predominantly on fish, most likely herring, both in the summer and with our winter work as well. And southeastern Alaska was a predominantly krill fish mix as well as, as Kodiak. So again, trophically they were distinct. Prince William Sound. So, and in Prince William Sound, how did we really know what they were eating? So, as I said, other areas they were eating herring and krill, and we we um, took it a step further from from using the the um, just finding being able to lucky enough to have those whales 
um, bring those hair or stun the herring at, at depth and have them come to the surface um, using direct observation. And we have done fatty acid in the um, um, trophic, uh, the, the stabilized top data for the um, winter work is, is coming in. We, we're having that analyzed as we speak. Um, but um, another way that is really good to figure out exactly what they're feeding is that you can follow them very, very closely. So it's really unusual to have them um, stun those fish at depth and have them come to the surface. So and this is a trick I learned from uh, studying killer whales is that you can figure out what killer whales are eating by, by really being vigilant and following them pretty closely and picking up prey samples. And so we did this for probably a half hour. I leaned over this boat, the auklet in, in um, big wooden boat, and we got this one herring scale because this whale was feeding on the surface and it was doing just a tr straight line trajectory. We knew it was feeding on some type of fish. And then what happened next was pretty amazing. The whale just opened it, and this has never happened either in Southeast. This whale just opened its mouth and gave us like a hundred, a thousand fish. It was just incredible, just right next to the boat. So we got quite a few of them before the birds did. Um, oh, there's another graduate student. She graduated, Heather Riley. She just, she was on us, uh, some trips with us. And so she's, you know, she gets to be out on the back deck in the rain, collecting, doing the herring. We got all the fun work, John and I, collecting the fish. So that's another way. But the really cool way is, is verifying what the prey is uh, using a, um, a DIDSEN, which is a dual frequency identification sonar. And this is Kevin Boswell, dressed in his, uh, his uh, lightweight jacket and his corduroy pants. He's from Louisiana, and he always dressed like this. In the middle of October, he dressed like this, and he was always cold. So, um, <laughs> but this is really a cool tool, and you can, it's basically ultrasound for the ocean. And you can use um, sonar or the hydroacoustics with sounders coupled with this Ditson and really get a good idea of what these whales are feeding on. And we did this a few times. And so you can see, this is a, it's just like ultrasound you'd have if you went to the doctor's office. This is the bottom of the ocean here. And the Ditson is, is up here. And it's, it's, like it's upside down like 16 meters away or something like that. So, and this, this aggregate, this was right on the bottom in Lynn Canal in the winter, and this is when those herring are laying down in those, what we think are pretty deep, dense aggregations. Well, this showed deep, deep red, which is the densest um, um, color on the echo sounder. You can see they aren't that, what I learned from this is that it might look like they're packed like sardines down there, but really they aren't quite as thick as we thought they were. And so what's, what, we also got sea lions that are um, charging through here, and you can really look at the speed of the sea lion and also how unsuccessful these sea lions are. They, they really, I know, they, it takes them a lot. We did not see very many successful prey captures for in sea lions, and we were just trying to verify the, um, the, uh, verify the hydroacoustic data with the Didson data for this. So we, they were able to measure a humpback, and this is what I really, really want to use the Didson for, is because, um, those known age whales that we have, we could get it. The age structure of known age whales because you can measure each individual fish and they measured each individual whale. And, and I can't do the math on this because it, you, you can just measure and it pops up right at the little Ditson machine when you're doing the analysis. And this was developed for um, the Gulf of Mexico because apparently working in the Gulf of Mexico is like working in chocolate milk. So you can't see anything and it's really difficult to use sound. hydroacoustics. I think they have a hard time verifying it and it's shallow, and so they've developed this Didson, which is a, it's um. And we did a study comparing the, um, we actually hung the Didson over the side and sampled fish that were um, near, the, near our boat, and we actually got a, a age, age uh, got the sizes, and we measured them with the, uh, the same school exactly, with the same fish exactly with the Didson, and we came out a really nice sample size. So we're pretty, certain that well, we are c convinced that the, the fish size that we can measure on the Ditson is the same as the fish size in, for real. So that's one of the um, cool tools. And the conclusions from this prey study from Prince William Sound, we really did show that Prince William Sound whales are exclusively feeding on herring during the fall and winter. And, um, and these whales that are feeding on herring do mostly depart by December. And however, what's interesting in Prince William Sound, we did have this small influx of whales that came from somewhere else that came into Prince William Sound in the uh, middle of the, uh, uh, in November. And we're not quite sure what that's all about, but by the time we 
went back in the fall, those same whales weren't there anymore. So there's some other uh, influx, outflux of whales that are happening in Prince William Sound. But we found over 200 whales in Prince William Sound in the winter, which was pretty amazing because it, we were based out of Cordova and nobody really goes out in, in Prince William Sound much in the winter apparently because you have to cross Hinchinbrook entrance and they thought we were absolutely crazy. But for coming from southeast, going from Cordova to the east to west side of Prince William Sound is really just like going between Juneau and Petersburg in southeast, so it's not that far in a distance, even though it is similarly rough conditions. And it's, you just have to be careful working in the winter. And I guess I should say when Mike said, you know, everybody wants to work on whales and I, you know, I'm really doing it, well, I'm doing it and I've always started and my real love has always been doing it in the fall and winter and, and, and that's where people really kind of draw the line, you know. So the Hawaii researchers, you never catch them up here in the winter time. <laughs> so so. Um, the future of humpbacks. There we are in Sitka Sound, that's Mount Edgecombe. Um, interactions with fishing gear as these whales increase, especially in the waters of southeastern Alaska and around the Gulf of Alaska in general, we're going to have more interactions with fishing gear. Um, vertical lines in, in particular, um, gill nets in for a set net fishery. Um, it's just going to be taking vigilance and really, I think, a, a, a big push in terms of educating. I know you guys don't have the issue up here, but people set a lot of pots for sp sport, commercial um, subsistence for shrimp, king crab, you name it, even black cod in southeastern Alaska. And it's really going to take not putting, just putting out enough line. Don't enough so you have your scope so you're not going to lose your pot but don't just dump it out just because you're too lazy to to measure it because that's really where it, humpbacks love to play in things kelp sticks whatever it is on the surface especially if you're a calf and that's where you're really going to get in trouble and that's where a lot of whales get um, entangled and get caught fortunately janet nielsen did her master's thesis funded by sea grant um, a few years ago on the scar, she did a scarring study looking at how many whales have scars that were, you can confirm that they were caught around their tailstock. And she found that all, o over half of those whales actually self-released. So we know that whales can get out of line, but not all of them get out of line. And this right here is a, is a whale um, trailing a crab pot, right there. That's, that's cut, and you really don't want to cut that because that's, you know, and learning how to disentangle these whales. You know, I first disentangled my first whale. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing in um, like 1986, I think. And, you know, essentially you get right up close to it and you use, um, this is a whale in Hawaii actually. And I think this is a whale, this is a buoy that was cut, re they got, see how it's wrapped around the, the pec fin, around the body? This is a really tough disentanglement. And um, this, was an Alaska shrimp pot, commercial shrimp pot, and the guy actually in Wrangell has that in his shed now. And that's a success story. We actually could assign it to a gear type and the whale got free. So here is a, here we are disentangling a whale in Frederick Sound. We've got all these kegging buoys. You use old whaling techniques. You keg them, you just slow them down. You don't cut off the buoy because that's your, 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 how you f tell where the whale's going. And, um, this whale is tangled around the tailstock. This was a sort of success story. The whale was in Frederick Sound and it was getting late and the weather was getting bad and we have telemetry buoys we can attach to the whale. And I said, Frederick Sound, no problem. This whale is going to stay here. So we put the telemetry buoy on and then, he's, then he just took off and zoomed down to Chatham Strait nearly all the way out into the Gulf. So ended up not being able to retrieve that telemetry buoy for probably another month, which is a risk when you put a telemetry buoy on and they're expensive uh, pieces of equipment so you have to be really careful and this is something we don't want to get good at doing and I don't want to get good at doing this what we really want to do is work uh, proactively to prevent this from happening and that's where it takes some education um, they also get hit by vessels and this is going to happen more and more this summer we had I think three or four uh, whales show up dead in southeastern Alaska whale watching does have an impact but I think it's not as big as some of these other issues like getting really cut right there with a prop. And this whale in 1999 was uh, on the bow of this cruise ship and the ship stopped. The naturalist got a really quick uh, camera shot and you can see where the whale's impacted right here. Just smacked right in there. The ships go through Frederick Sound at 22 knots and if that's where you're dense, that's quite a dense aggregation of humpbacks there. Um, it's just a matter of time before we probably have a humpback. I just can't even imagine how many humpbacks we're going to start losing. Um, 
not that the population is, is large enough, it can sustain some mortality, but we really probably don't want this type of mortality. This is a whale on the Sapphire Princess that came into Juneau this summer. Right there, you can see how it was uh, struck right there. And um, they did a partial necropsy, it was inconclusive. Um, it's actually one of my pet peeves is that if we're going to do a necropsy is that we actually do one all the way and we do it sufficiently where we can actually say what the cause of death was. So, um, and these whales can actually sustain quite a bit of damage. This whale is still, she's 9, uh, 986 I think. She is still, um, she really got hit by something hard and that's all the way down into the muscle layer and it's healed over. Um, she's still a reproductive female as is this whale. So um, they can sustain quite a bit of damage. Um, when you're out boating, um, it's just if you see a whale surface, it's usually really likely that there's going to be another whale that's probably not quite up. So it's just taking vigilance and really watching um, what's out there with your eyes and slowing down. I mean, people still don't quite get it in um, southeastern Alaska that, that there are whales out there. And although once somebody does hit a whale, and usually it's going to cause for the most part, a 28-foot boat has struck and killed the juvenile humpback in Glacier Bay. So, but mostly it's the larger ships, and if you go slower, the whale will sustain less damage. But, but even a skiff that, that ends up bumping into a whale, it really puts the fear of God into the person driving that boat. It really scares them. And so, um, it's, it, because the per people in the boat will, for the most part, with the small vessels, um, have uh, more injuries than injuries to the whale. Well, this is what's happening. Oh, so, sorry about that. In um, Chatham Strait, it's actually happening all over in BC and other areas in Alaska. But where we're studying this is in, in Chatham Strait. There's five area, five uh, shore shore-based sites where smolts, salmon smolts, and fry are released. Uh, the hatcheries have uh, produced these smolts and fry to enhance the salmon production. And um, lo and behold, humpbacks have figured this out. This is a humpback whale inside a net pen. Um, the summary that we learned, we just did a really, working with the, the um, industry, the hatcheries have been really great. We used, worked with Hidden Falls and um, uh, NSRA, Northern Southeast Regional Aquaculture, Little Port Walter, which is a, a, a hatchery that NOAA runs, um, and Port Armstrong, which is Armstrong Kita, a really beautiful place near Port um, Alexander. Five release sites, and um, they start showing up about, the whales show up about April 30th. Port Armstrong had a tragedy this, this year. They, they released their chum salmon, didn't have any whales, so that they thought they were home free. And they'd been nursing these beautiful um, two-year-old uh, king salmon smolts. And they released a whole, every single one of them. And a whale came in and bubble net lunch fed right at the release site all night and got every single one of them. So, so it was just was a disaster for, this, for those that hatchery. Um, so for the five facilities, we were able, at, all we wanted to say this summer, prove this summer was absolutely whales are eating your fish. And we, <laughs> we are able to say that. We could show whales are eating your fish. Um, how they're eating them and how the cues are using is a different story. However, at Miss Cove, they didn't, the whales were there and they didn't eat their fish. And we can't quite figure this out, except that Miss Cove is an area where the fish are raised up in the lake and they're piped down and it's a different topography, so we're trying to figure that one out. But Hidden Falls had the biggest problem. The more fish were released there, and um, it was just huge. And interestingly, there was a, the strongest relationship was between, with whale sightings and whether or not a release occurred the day before. So it seems to, the whale, the release might happen, but the whales don't get there right away. They may get there a day later. And also, there might be an acoustic cue that the whale um, presence increased when there was more skiff activity. So it's some of these cues that we need to start teasing out. Um, and we did have a repeat offender. We're fairly convinced it's, it's uh, culturally transmitted between whale to whale and it's a learned behavior. This whale was in, this is a 2010 this year. It's the same whale that was there in 08. And uh, 07, this is our catalog photograph. So the whale comes back year after year. We're, going, we're not quite certain if it's the same whales that are, that are down at Port Armstrong as the whales that are up at Hidden Falls, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, anyway, it's an interesting study. We really 
the industry really wants to work with us in trying to figure out how to mitigate it, and they're really willing to change their behavior. They've tried things like towing the, the fish out to the middle of Chatham, but they release the fish and they come right back into where they were just um, released. And what the hatcheries have provided is just this perfect storm for a humpback, or actually it's a perfect storm for the hatcheries because they provided uh, barriers. Humpbacks love to feed against barriers, so they have those nice net pens and docks for, for the whales to use to, hurt, to basically trap the fish. They've deposited these nice little rich fat bombs that are predator stupid for a number of days. And so they're just sitting ducks for the whales. And so, so there's, it's just, it's like a no brainer that the whales have figured it out. Now it's just trying to outsmart them. And um, when I gave the talk in Juneau, this uh, Coast Guard guy that works on gliders came up and he said, have you heard about this tone that um, the Japanese and it's used in Asia to herd fish. So basically they've trained these net pen raised fish to come to when they feed them, it's like a dinner bell. They put this tone in the water and the fish, and the fish come to the tone. And so he was saying, well, if maybe you could train the salmon smolts to come to that tone, and then you could just basically, like the Pied Piper, just take them away. So it, I think it's not as simple as that. But I think it's, it's really gonna take thinking um, uh, in a different way, just getting your mind wrapped around it in a different way. And it's the same thing with the sperm whale project. I work with longliners that are um, trying to reduce sperm whales that are learning to take fish off their lines and and this again it's working with the fishermen and really coming up with some clever ways to outsmart those sperm whales but I think that's a challenge because those whales are super smart if it was a humpback whale around that long line it'd be like a ball of twine those those sperm whales are amazingly adept at, at just picking a single fish off a line so I'm going to end with um a why do they breach and this is Everybody asks me this question and there's no one reason why they breach. It's like a gesture. You could be rooting your team onto victory, shaking your fist, or you could be madder than a hornet and shaking your fist. Unless you know some context behind it, you really can't assign um, a reason to the breach, breaching them. Uh, when we were in Seymour, we had a really heavily loaded float plane. It took off and a whale was happened to be right under the, the not, it was about 50 feet, but the whale really didn't like that sound pressure. Uh, and, it, and it just shot out of the water and it lobtailed and breached for like 20 minutes. So that was a direct cause and effect. And sometimes they do it for fun, they might do it for communication, uh, they might do it for getting rid of parasites. They do breach when it's windy. If it's over 20 or 25 knots, you'll notice they all start breaching into the wind. And why? It's a mystery. So, so one of the uh, things about these humpbacks, they still are out there full of mysteries. Even though I've been doing this 30 years, it's an amazing um, opportunity to still find something new because they're always showing me something new. Um, we have a website, uh, www.alaskahumpbacks.org. This is a collaborative database with Glacier Bay National Park. Um, it's a great collaboration. And for me, um, you know, I'm not about ready to stop doing humpback work, but you know, it's getting to the point where I need to think of leaving a legacy and where is my data going to go in the future. And, uh, and where it's going to go is that we're going to work collaboratively to set up this um, common database and it'll be an online data entry system for future biologists and it'll be managed by the Park Service. So this, um, and we have a new whale catalog, our whale poster and it's back there and it's, it's if it, they have $15, it helps to support whale research. Um, I had one made, oh and I think we sold them all out in the oh, early 2000 and everybody kept asking me when we were gonna make a new one and of course I never had enough time to do anything that I'm supposed to be doing and getting a whale poster together was like the last thing but I came into my office and I had an intern from Bates College and she had done the whole thing. She had even gotten the place to get it printed so we printed it and we're, we're now back to selling it. She actually did a much nicer job than I ever did and we have a key this time that actually has some information about each whale and if you want to know even more information you can always email us from the website. So. And other funding and support, the Park Service, University, TESMARI, the Ted Stevens Marine Research Institute, there's probably not an acronym everybody knows up here, right? Um, it's because Ted Stevens funded the Lena Point Oak Bay Lab. And um, Mark Kelly is a photographer out of Juneau that's generously supported this research. And then agencies of Forest Service and Marine Mammal Commission. And I'm willing to take questions. But if... Um, And if, if, uh, if people want to get up and leave, I know I've been talking for a long time, so as you probably could tell I could probably talk on humpbacks forever. So um, people can ask questions or get up and leave or, uh, sure. When you say
say stunning, does that mean that they're dead? They are just like knocked out or? Yeah, they're kind of just, the, more when about the, that. The, the fish that were just, uh, they were still alive, but they were, they were stunned on the surface. And some of them might have survived and gone back to death or, or some of them maybe were just, they were still just recently, very, very recently dead or just ha half alive. They probably just slapped them with their tails. So they'll do that on the surface. Sometimes you'll see a ball of, um, of fish on the surface and the whale come and just slap their tail and stun them. So, or they, um, boy, humpbacks, and they use bubbles in every context, you know. You know, it's just, they use bubbles everywhere in all the oceans. They just use them a little bit differently. And um, one of the things that, uh, they, 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 will small, they will blow real small bubble nets but they also will do a thing called flick feeding and they, they will basically ha be upside down, will have their tails straight up and they'll start slapping the water like this, just flicking their tail until their flukes submerge and as soon as they submerge they come forward with a lunge so what they've created is a forward wave. They're just using physics and ocean movement just to push their food forward and then they come with a little lunge. So they're pretty clever. So, pretty clever with that and if you um, see one whale doing that the next day they all will be doing it so they really learn from each other they're definitely aware of what ever all their other buddies are doing in the ocean so. I had a question too actually where is the data the richest on whales and then secondly who has jurisdiction over whales uh, let's see where is the data the richest um, really you might have to narrow it down to a species. Do you mean humpbacks in the U.S.? The Gulf of Maine has an, quite an extensive long-term data, data set, but I would have to say I think the most, I mean, I think their data has been collected quite, uh, probably it's, compare, it's probably a toss-up between the Gulf of Maine data out of the Center for Coastal Research and the whale da the data on humpbacks that has, have been collected at Glacier Bay National Park. The park data has, has been collected since Jurassic started in the uh, early 70s, and then it was picked up by the Park Service in the early 80s, or late 70s and early 80s, and it's since 85 they've had a long-term monitoring, and they do a really, really thorough job. And the cool thing about the Park Service data is that, I mean, and I, I worked as a Park Service biologist for um, a number of years, but there have only been three of us that have ever worked on that data set since 1985. So it's been collected very, very consistently. And then with, with um, uh, so I, I was working on humpbacks before I went there and afterwards and, and then at the park. So all the southeastern Alaska data is collected on a very, very similar um, level. And that's pretty unusual when you come to long-term data sets. Usually what you find is that somebody's collecting data and then somebody else moves in and then they have to reinvent the wheel and say, whoever did it before did a lousy job, I'm going to do it better, so they do something different and then it just changes. So there's an evolution and it's not, I'm not saying that we haven't taken our own um, special interests and done things differently um, because what we have to do is every once in a while is, is get together and we have like this data powwow and it's like, you know, uh oh, we said we were going to do it this way but I'm doing it this way now and you're doing it this way now and then we have to come to a meeting of the minds. So and those are really always a lot of fun meetings because, but no, it's really good. It's a good group of people to work with. And it's been a really, since, you know, I, I didn't stay at the park because um, for a number of reasons. And it's been a really great collaboration for me with that having access to still to have access to that data. And then now Ock Bay Lab, the, the people there have started this whale uh, predation study. And that's again, a really nice collaboration for me, so. It's really a rich um, place for me to work right now. So, how do uh, whales make their sounds? Ooh, you want to? That's a good question. How do humpbacks make their sounds? Well, nobody really knows. It's some manipulation of air inside their uh, heads. You want to go for that? Any, anybody want to venture on that one? But you can watch the animals make noise underwater. No air is coming out of their mouth or out of their noises out of their noises, out of their noses. So if you were to hold your nose and hold your mouth shut and try to figure out how to make noise inside you without letting air come out of your mouth or nose, it'd be pretty hard, but somehow they figured out how to do it. They can make that noise inside themselves. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and, and nobody's proof positive how it's happened yet, yeah. So I, you had a second question, the other gentleman that I didn't answer. Yes, I was curious about jurisdiction. 
oh, internationally and within state and federal waters? Well, if you're just talking humpback specifically, it's the National Marine Fishery Service. So NOAA, you know, they um, in U.S. waters. Um, internationally, it's IW, IW International Whaling Commission. Um, so can't like Canada is not part of the IWC, so uh, it's it's and Canada has their own management jurisdiction for humpbacks in their waters. Um, Yes, CITES, yeah, I'm trying to think, I mean, uh, internationally, that's a, that's a good question, but I think it's just probably, I'm just going to go out on a whim and just say it's probably just within the jurisdiction of those, whatever the boundary, country boundaries, so, but, but in terms of outside of the three mile limit, yeah. You know, I, that does get to be kind of an issue when you're doing, say, working offshore Canada and you collect biopsy samples and you know, off three miles, you know, wow, so do I have to go through CITES to get them, you know, it's, it, it can be problematic, so it's kind of a loaded question. So, anybody else? Oh, sure. Do they sleep, and if so, how? Sure, do they sleep? Uh, yeah, humpbacks do sleep, they can shut off parts of their, they don't sleep like we do, they don't just totally conk out, they, they, they shut off, and I don't know how they do this, maybe the physiologist can, they basically can shut off part of their, half their brain and then sleep and then, and they take like catnips. You know, you're not seeing them sleep for eight hours at a time. So that's as far, anything to add to that? That's, that's as far as I know for humpbacks. Um, humpbacks, they can be dead to the world. That's how some of them get those big honking scars on them. They can just be zoned out. It was once in, in, in a little tiny skiff and we sat, we turned the engine off to have lunch and we looked down there was a humpback about 20 feet below us just dead to the world. So we just kind of paddled out of his way because didn't want to startle him. So, and they do, they just kind of droop, they put their heads down and their tails down and they just, that's what they do, they just zone out. I think we have one last question here in the back. Yeah. Hi Jan. Um, what, how long is their gestation period? Or did you mention that and I missed it? The gestation is about 11 months for about humpbacks. Months. So they become pregnant sometime in the winter and then give birth en route or on the breeding grounds, you know, about a year later. So, so. Okay, well you will all help me in thanking Dr. Straley one last time. Thanks.